All right, welcome to our four o'clock session. Just want to point out that uh, there are ESIP stickers out there, and I'm so happy I finally have my laptop suitably adorned with a shiny ESIP sticker. So welcome to the session on 2.4 petabytes uh, ingested into the, into the cloud. So I'm Ben Galuski from NCSA. This is Don Petrovic, also from NCSA. And the disembodied voice you'll be hearing over your head is Matthias Carrasco Kent from also from our office who couldn't make it today. And oh yes. So we're gonna be talking, giving a bit of a uh, discussion of a, a particular problem that we were asked to solve and you know, talk about some of the, the tools and techniques that we use in there. And then we're gonna finish up with um, kind of what we what we learned and uh, you know, some of the experiences from it and, and maybe point out some conclusions and directions. But first, what is big data? And so, here yeah, I've got my numbers here. And so we did a survey of a bunch of um, climate scientists from the University of Illinois just to kind of get a sense of what they think big data is. So I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if you think this is big data. So one petabyte. Big data? Yeah. That's by the way, this is this is the biggest number I've got. So we'll, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're going down. Right? Do I mean are there keep people? Are there yeah, keep your hand up. Does anybody think a petabyte small? Good size. Okay. Okay. So if you think one petabyte's big, raise your hand. Okay, and then start putting your hands down when you think I've gotten to like, no, this is not big data. So how about uh, 300 terabytes? Okay. How about 100 terabytes? Mm -hmm. 30 terabytes? Uh, 10 terabytes? Uh, three terabytes? One terabyte? How about 100 gig? All right, we got... <laughs> so... Does anyone have any experiences of why you you felt like that was big data? Do you want to talk, especially some of the, the outliers? There is a microphone. There's another Ben running around with microphones. Um, my definition has been um, more data than you can fit on your workstation. Right. That's... Oh, we're going to make you work, Ben. <laughs> So I was, I've been kind of spoiled because I've been dealing with very large data sets, but uh, I've always had the idea that big data was more a matter of the purpose than the size. So I mean, the data can be physically large, but if you're not doing data mining on it, are you doing big data? Like is, is the binary file for Rise of the Skywalker big data? <laughs> it's, it's a movie, you're not doing data mining on mm -hmm. it, right? Okay, so part of it, so, if you have the, the, depending on your tooling, running on your laptop could be big, or if it doesn't fit on your laptop, although maybe just copying, it depends on what you're actually doing to the data. Okay, so what's what else do you have? To... Um, at least personally, because I'm with NCEI, the National <laughs> Centers for Environmental Information, um, and this is personally, not the rest of NCEI. Once it hits a terabyte, um, it can be slow to get in, um, then you've got to store it, and then you've got to serve it back out. Uh, we have sets bigger than that. If people want to search by granules, um, it becomes an unwieldy thing to store and search and move around and steward. Mm -hmm. So there it's, it's a lot of like the ingress and life cycle issues around the data. Anybody else have any? color to add to their definition of big data. Okay, yeah, thank you. That uh, sets the stage a little bit, and then we're gonna be talking about our, our big data set. Hello? Was there a hello? Yes, uh, I just wanted to check that you can hear me. Sorry, this is Matias. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's Matias, yes, okay. Okay, okay so, our work centered around supporting a professor at Illinois, Larry D. Girolamo, and 
he's a climate scientist and he's ex he's an expert in the Terra mission. Uh, I think almost everybody here might know what the Terra satellite is, but here is an explanatory side from from uh, a deck from Eric Moyer. Um, Terra satellite is a school bus sized satellite that was launched in 99, began producing scientifically useful data in 2000. It supports five different instruments that, that orbit the Earth. Uh, its orbital mechanics are such that in 233 swaths, it covers the whole Earth, or paths, as they call them. And every, every path is, the orbit is constructed and manipulated such that at the crossing time at the equator for each path is the same time for every crossing. And so there's a large, large number of, of data files associated with this from five different instruments. And of course, if you want to study the climate, they're, not, they're all not nicely packaged for you in a time series. So in the scientists don't, so this is a, me acting as a rapporteur. I was not around when this work started, but you know, Terra is one of the, Terra is a pr premier historical record for climate science, science where the gold standard in climate science is a 30 year record. And here this thing is going on 20, so pretty good. Hmm? Yeah, Terra turned 20, so 20 odd. Uh, it's it's vested in retirement. Right. The the, the uh, and in in bold is the is the main purpose of this one of the main motivations of this personal work is to shift from looking at if you would incidents a hurricane a volcano or something to begin to study the whole Earth as a climate system, which means you want large swaths of territory and you want uh, long periods of time. Right, so large scale analytics with long records, right? You can consider this a kind of niche, probably most people that do earth science don't want it, but guys that study the atmosphere and atmospheric changes or climate care about this, right? And this, this, the raw data here is over a petabyte. The raw data, if you wanted to get all the, all the data out of the DAX is over a million files. So he proposed a, and got an award in the access program and with these people listed, went off to build a fused data set that was more tractable for science analysis than collecting all the raw files from the DAC and would be reusable in the sense that if you built this once, people could use this. You would, each, each project wouldn't have to do its own gather and acquire some of, its, some of the un understanding of transforming the data. You know, for example, out of packed ins into, into uh, floats. And this is, I apologize for the mistake my, proposing the slide, but these are the sort of science questions that he thought were relevant to this, that this data set would be relevant for. On the right under questions is the science, and on the left is motivating use cases for using data from multiple instruments. So it isn't just taking MISA, it isn't just taking MODIS. It would be using the suite of instruments, the subset of the instruments that are, that are interesting for each kind of topic. And so these are investigations this person proposed, and you assume that there are other people with similar investigations that may want, may, may want to use the data set. So the proposal was to transfer all the data to NCSA uh, and then go off and build a fused data set to, to make analysis easier, right? And the, and the result, with using a workflow like this. But in plain language, the main motivation for the project was basically this guy's a professor, he has students, and assembling the data for each project was burdensome on the students, slowed things down. And after a student had assembled the data set for a project, that data set wasn't good for further projects. So the idea is that if you fuse all the data, package it all orbit by orbit, which is how a scientist thinks about it, or at least how our scientists think about it, uh, and then denormalize it all so it's easy to access and access through uniform methods that research would be ex research would be accelerated. So the result is a shrinking from sort of order of a million files to 80,000 files where each each file represents an orbit on a path. All right, and the primary use case envisioned in the project was streaming through the data, not necessarily going in and picking out features. So, the, so you know what? Uh, so, so this is done. Um, we have some comments about where the data is now, but I'll save those for later. But like, like the fusion process to make the data more easier to use, 
sort of denormalized it, and so it's fluffed up from 1.1 petabytes to 2.4. The if people want to understand what's in it, there's the NASA NASA normal required document, the algorithm theoretical document. And examples of what was done in the fusion process was not so much to change the meaning of the data, but to turn things into floats and not the scaled integers that compress nicely and pack nicely. To have a common data model for latitude and longitude, apply lossless compression with an HDF5 format, because if you if you really decompressed it all, it'd be nine petabytes. And use the standard data models, hoping for files that would be usable in the cloud and usable in POSIX. Remember this data was, this, this project completed its fusion about two years ago. What's interesting from another take is the kind of resources that I took to do this. So he obtained a, a AST award, and the AST award, well, did it pay for everything? The answer is no, but it paid for the effort, right, to provide the code and run the workflows and do all the data management necessary over several runs to produce the data set. Of course, you know, when you work in NASA, you stand on the shoulders of giants. And so he stood on the shoulders of the DAX, right, that provided all the input data and additional tools that help you locate the data and help you use it. The computing and storage resources were provided at no cost on no cost merit based awards. So, so he did not get the resource, the physical resources to do the computations as part of the award. And in fact, he was able to use the Illinois fraction of the NSF Blue Waters computer and another NSF machine called Roger that was supply that was put up to explore different compute hardware compute modalities and how they would best apply to our science. And of course, these are NSF resources. NSF resources are provided on a five year life cycle and the life cycle of these machines are over. The gather operation, if you want to see quantities, here it is. And the protocols that, this slide was a bit of archeology, span the protocols that we thought were used, right? The, the length of time to do the ingest at the time the project was performed surprised the project and necessitated making on-premise on, on copies of all the raw data, well, all the input data, I'm sorry, from the DAX because the fear of, a time, the, fear of the time to re-ingest it would be, would be long. And uh, a tape-based dairy disc carousel was the metaphor for production. The data were fun fundamentally lived on tape. You'd fault up the, the pieces you want, make your output, push that down the tape onto the next one. The, of course, you know, anytime someone gets involved in big data, many runs were needed because you go make it, you make it a little bit of it, you think it's right, you make a lot more, you learn you weren't, you weren't correct, right? And on the other hand, the processing was embarrassingly parallel. Each, each output file can be produced independently of each other because the inputs are reasonably separable, right? And I said, as I said, two machines were used. I guess I won't go over that again. The uh, high throughput machine on Roger were, was very usable for the system. So in the end, this is a project that produced a big data set. And in the end, it took, it took resources from three different places to achieve it, right? The resources from NASA funded the people, the effort, the knowledge and the and all of the all of the, almost all of the inputs used in the system. NSF was the sponsor for a significant computer, and Illinois provided fractions of the Illinois Blue, Wa Blue Waters computer to compute to complete this. And I think that is a theme for projects of this scale, is that it, it actually required the inputs from many institutions to produce this data set. Right, this, the size of a of, of an access award would not have covered the cost of the the cost of using the resources. So now, if Matthias is here and he's going to talk about delivery to the cloud, the OSN and use, and I think uh, he needs to say next when we yeah. change the slide. Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll be your I'll be your next button. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Can you hear him? Yes. Yes. yes there are nods in the room. Okay. Okay, so if there's any question, I, I would ask uh, either Ben or Don to repeat the question, so I can I can I can answer that properly. So I'm gonna so so Don give a, a very a very nice introduction on on the Terra project and well not not just Terra but the Terra Fusion project, and then and then I'm talking about what we did next and how we're thinking about you know long term 
uh, archiving and, and, and storage of all that data that was produced during the fishing process, that it was covered by the access proposal. This is kind of a little bit outside uh, of the proposal, a little bit outside um, uh, the scope. So if you go next. So in digital idea, it was anticipated that uh, the NDS, the National Data Service, which is also um, a center within NCSA, was to um, host this 2.4 petabyte of data, um, fused data product. But the NDSAs did not you know, materialize at the end um, as an as a NSF organization. So we need to look for, for a different solution. Blue Water has been you know, in the process of being decommissioned uh, in the next year. So we need to look for something else and where to move. And also since this is a basically NASA um, data, we also wanted to be harmonized with, with NASA and try to find a, a common solution that would fit everybody, not just our scientists, but everybody who wants to use this data. Um, so next please. So what we are currently, uh, or our current solution was to uh, migrate all of the data that was produced at NCSA, these 2.4 petabyte in 80,000 um, files uh, in a storage, sorry, in, in a common storage into um, into Amazon, into the NASA uh, AWS account. Basically, we wanted to hand it off to to the NASA cloud. Um, account so they can they can have a copy and then we can have a long-term archiving of this data so we're talking about um, three petabytes of storage well so this is the machine that we used to do the transfer uh, it's a three petabyte storage machine so it's a, it's a shared um, file system with two machines uh, two virtual machines you know host, hosting um, um, the data or sorry, having access to the EPFS uh, file system we both with 40 uh, GPFS, uh, sorry, gigabytes per second network interfaces. So, so first, we since we have the data there, we start, you know, accessing and providing access to 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 Larry's group and the scientists here by using the HD5 or, or the HDF uh, server, uh, access via Grif FTP, and also internal communication between NCSA uh, storage and the campus cluster and some and some others. Um, these are the machines that we use for transferring the data into into AWS, and there's some consideration that you know we're taking into into account before doing that. Obviously, it's the integrity uh, check of the files, so we want to make sure that the files that were generated at, at at birth are the same files that we have on the on the on the file system, and then are the same files that are moved into, into Amazon. So we, we run uh, checksums and, and we had the original MD, MD5 sums from the files. And and how, how we did that was, was, was a challenge that we can discuss later if need to. Um, also, what kind of access we wanted to use, either you know, in frequent access, uh, just normal S3 access, or this intelligent tier where this kind of uh, in-between component. Um, Transfer is, is, is an issue uh, when you're talking about you know 2.5 petabyte. Um, so we, we want to we reach about 800 megabytes per second using these two machines using multi-part uh, streaming, and that was that, that was good because we have uh, good network cards and good you know uh, backup machines. But usually it's not the case. Um, and if you are ever you know use data from from the DAC directly, you know that those rates are not even close to what the DAC provide uh, in, in general, which is much, much, much slower. So we, 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 we had this very, very nice uh, rate. And we believe uh, that we can even increase that, that, that transfer rate if we have yet another machine uh, attached to that. Uh, another option we considered briefly was using a snowball, which is basically the ship uh, out uh, storage. We copy all the data and we ship it back to, to the data center. And finally, the, what is the file format that we want? Because uh, uh, if you work with HTTP5 file, file, uh, sorry, file format before, you know they are not particularly cloud friendly. Even though now there's solutions to to overcome that. Uh, when we start thinking about this, it wasn't very very cloud friendly because each file is 30 gigabytes, and if you want to just get 
one instrument or one portion of the of the data, you need to stage the whole file, and that also incurs an extra cost. Now, um, there's there solutions to act, actually access partially files in HDFI that also is open source, um, and then we are, we are looking into that as well. So also, the, we, we need to consider the cost and the data access model, so who's paying for, for what, and provide guidelines and documentation for scientists to, on how to access the data, how to maximize the outcome of this data by minimizing the cost uh, incurring to either running this on directly on Amazon or copying the file in a local machine or a local cluster to run, etc. So, so we went through that process and we successfully managed to transfer all that data into um, into the NASA AWS account with the with the help of many people that I'll mention that in a minute. And um, so, uh, next please. Sorry. So, so that you know brings us to our, our first delivery, which is uh, which is you know moving all, all of the data into 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 the NASA Amazon uh, account. Uh, we had, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of help from the Marshall um, and, and, and now Goddard, but at the, at the time, Marshall uh, through the impact. Um, oh, one person to show. Sorry, there's a question there. Not from here. Oh, I hear some. Okay. It was just coming from. Um, so uh, we we got a lot of help from the Marshall um, Space Center in moving into the into their account under the impact uh, project which is um, a whole um, you know under the direction for a whole and it was not necessarily affiliated to any any of the DAGs, uh, but they they kind of took um, took care of, of, of that of this problem and they provided us with an account they brought us with a bucket and then we had weekly meetings in coordinating this transfer and trying to make sure that all the data landed correctly. Um, obviously, the goal is to preserve the data set on this NASA provided uh, storage. Um, and I, I mentioned already the, the rate that we, we, we achieve. And so we have some some lessons learned during the process on, for example, you know, um, how you want to restructure the bucket if you want to use just one bucket versus multiple buckets. We went for just one bucket and have hierarchical, you know, structure files within within that bucket. So each file basically is an object within this three, but it's only just one bucket. And and then when you can access that, so there's a lot of well, minimal information within the, within the file name itself. And then there's also um, kind of a folder structure that allows you to go through uh, the files that, that you need, uh, in particular when you talk about orbits and and years, right? Um, next, please. So, so after we, we finished that delivery, which was um, a, few, a few months ago, we started discussing with Amazon people as well, how are we gonna provide access to the community, to the scientists, but also to the general community, because there's a lot of value on this data. Uh, on this data set in particular, and we 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 agree to have um, even though they have a full copy of the whole data set, they don't want to provide access just yet because we want to you know there's a lot of uh, data modeling and, and and access model that needs to be defined. So in the meantime, we created a subsample of this data set with a 150 terabytes. Uh, of worth of data, but this is this is data in different orbits. So this is data covering the whole 2000 to 2015 period, but in a particular set of orbits. So it's covering just partial uh, section of the Earth, but you still have this time domain component, uh, which is now is in the Amazon um, public registry on US West 2, which also was arranged uh, arranged by, by NASA. And there's a link at the bottom to, to see the file and to access the documentation. And to start actually getting to through the data, um, so this this data supports you know the net, native use by 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 scientists. Uh, they also have that they might also have resources on AWS, so you can have everything run within one one single environment or ecosystem. But you can also download the data uh, into your local cluster or local machine. Um, 
if you go to the to the to the link and to see the metadata, you can actually see the, the orbits and how this uh, file was created and all the documentation needed to to access and manipulate these files. Um, but still, egress is not fully understood. I mean, still need to figure out how we we and NASA and, and in general how we're gonna um, access the data and allow people to access the data, um, especially because egress costs you know adds up to, to a lot of you know thousands of dollars when you talk about you know 2.4 petabyte of, of, of data. So this is this is something that um, needs to be you know carefully considered before before running to project because if you want to use this data, if you want to use the whole data set, then you need to start adding these costs into proposals. Uh, or or the other way around, if NASA or some other institution wants to house this data, they want to think about the cost of providing this data to, to the scientists. So this is still uh, being, being worked out. Next, please. So the uh, an alternative option that is also in a prototype uh, stage is to use what, what is called, it's a new project called the Open Storage Network, which is basically, it's, it's an NSF uh, project that if it's a network of institutions or places where you can have um, you know, this high speed network connection between them that allows you to have this storage uh, kind of distributed across these places to allow better access to it. So it's kind of similar to what Amazon is doing with these multiple regions, but using institutions and you know, using science as a driver and then allow the scientists to access the data the same way you would access the data through Amazon. So it's using the same, basically the same S3 API object-oriented um, infrastructure, but hosted by these uh, institutions. So this is a red of, this is a network of institutions that, um, that provide, you know, quick and fast access to different portion of the data and to different projects too. Um, this is still on a prototype phase, uh, but we already have, you know, a similar sample in the OSN and they have other samples as well um, that you can take a look at. So if you go to the next one, uh, that's showing the initial partners in this uh, OSN uh, network, including NCSA, and John Hopkins and some other places, and Diego uh, as well. Um, next, please. So, so the open storage network, network you know, the name says, oh, it's, it's open, uh, it's for storage, uh, but it's mostly for read-only, so it doesn't provide any computing capability. So you have to download the data somewhere to run uh, your programs. A different from, from, from Amazon is that you can have an Amazon EC2 instance and then you can get the data from S3, and then you can leave it all in just one place. Here, you need you need a place to to actually stage the data, but it's uh, even for this sample, it's for free, and it's basically a read-only uh, or download-only and only, uh, model. Um, and the idea is to is to see whether this is a viable solution for for storing the whole data set. We, we, we made this available during the AGU meeting at the same time as we made it available through Amazon. And we, we, we shared this with the scientists. There's a different set of orbits on each one of these data sets. And we wanna, we wanna prove how scientists access this data using this different mechanism to see how we're gonna move forward for the rest of the data. Um, next, please. So as I mentioned before, we, we do have a copy of a sample uh, so we do have a sample of the whole data set in the OSN. Um, we have uh, we have common areas both in Amazon and OSN, uh, but also we have some differences. You know, there's some orbits in the OSN that are not in the Amazon and vice versa. Um, the way to access this is using the same uh, Amazon S3 copy API. So if you're familiar with Amazon already, it shouldn't make any any difference. The only thing you need to change the endpoint. But everything should be the same, um, and there's a copy of, of of one of the orbits there, and then there's a link in the bottom to, on on how to access and summarize uh, what data and some useful commands to access these uh, data. Uh, next, please. So so as a summary of of how or why uh, sorry 
how and why we move the data into the cloud. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's the preservation of the data. Uh, even though Don mentioned that making these basic fusion files uh, can be reproducible, so you can rerun if you want to store just, just the original file. Having those already fused in a very nice or an organized way is, is very uh, valuable and it's very convenient for scientists. Um, the idea, obviously, or the science behind is to use was to maximize the use of all the five instruments uh, within the Terra. And then I'll explain one particular case that we are very, very interested on uh, involving, you know, AI, given that there's so much data, AI comes naturally into the game because there's so much you can extract that um, uh, other methods would, wouldn't do that. Um, the idea, not just, you know, providing uh, a way to store the data, but also how we're going to provide and easy the access to, to these data sets and allow, you know, the scientific community to make or to maximize the use of, of, of these data sets. Um, we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have two places for, uh, for scientists and the general public to access this data or at least a sample of this data. One is through Amazon directly or uh, the Amazon public registry or through the OSN. Both links are, are on the slide. So you can you feel, free, feel free to explore these data sets to, to even compare, you know, um, the rates uh, of, of the transfer or to get the data from, from one orbit in one set and the, uh, from other orbit in the other set. Um, this is all open and for free to use, and we are actually looking forward to, to hear comments and feedback on people using uh, this data set. Um, next, please. <coughs> so OSN is an uh, is, uh, NSF funded project, so, um, and then it's also uh, funded by the Schmidt Family Foundation. I just wanted to make sure that that's, that's covered. So before going to the next set of slides that we talk about uh, an actual use of this data, is, are there any, any questions? No hands are up. Any questions out there? I have a, a minor question. Here, he's never going to hear your question. I could just be loud. You can't. Yeah. Not I, I had a out. I had a very simple question on slide 18. You mentioned 800 megabytes per second of sustained throughput, or 800 megabits. Right. That one. Right. Okay, just checking. Because before yep. I think we just we'd mentioned bits. Okay, good. Oh, uh, that was a. Then we couldn't pick audio. That's okay. Cool. Oh, more questions. Another question. Yes, more questions. Actually, I have a comment and not a question. We just released, I'm from, HD, from the HDF group, so thank you for acknowledging our work. Uh, we just released uh, open source S3 driver uh, in 136 release, so you can use your desktop application and use this driver, which is very transparent, uh, to access data in cloud. Uh, it's not scalable, but it does its job and all tools are working with us. And the second one is we do have scalable sol solution. Once again, open source called HSDS, and you can use it with Python notebooks. So if you need help to help you to install it, we're, you know, way across the street, right? <laughs> so please talk to us. Thank you. Yes, yes, and that, that that's, I, I just saw that. So I just wanted to mention that when we were doing this, we, we knew that there was some work done on the S3 driver for HDFI, which basically allows you to access partial files. If you're familiar with HDFI format, allow, <clears throat> even if you were Python or desktop application, you can always access uh, partial files. So you don't have to load the whole data into memory. I mean, you're talking about 30 gigabytes of you know, file. But when you put that on S3, that's tricky to do. But now, just recently, and we're very happy to, to see that they released the, the driver for that. So now you can actually access a partial subset of the of one file, which is going to reduce your cost immensely if you're just looking for for support, you know, for a small chunk of the data. So so that's that's very very exciting, and we are looking forward to to, to use that. So. Okay. No more questions at this point. Good. Well, um, so so the reason uh, uh, this is this is kind of putting all that together, and then Ben is gonna you know do the final uh, you know slides. 
Um, so, so we talk about the Terra, the Terra Fusion. We talk about how we're going to move that into the cloud. And now I just want to go a little bit on why and, and uh, why it is important to have these basic fusion files, why it's important to have this cloud infrastructure around, and how we adopt that, and how NCSA um, is thinking about about these uh, these problems in general. So I want to talk a little bit about scientific cloud computing. So it's basically running science on 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 cloud-like infrastructure. Um, and next, please. So you've probably seen this slide or this concept many times before in different contexts. Uh, not this particular slide, but just general, this general idea of having this data lake or this central repository of data or just data that is so heavy that you don't want to just move it around. I like to use this concept of data gravity in my background is astronomy. Um, so, so you can think data as being like a big hole swallowing all of your uh, resources, right? You don't want to move that out of the potential well. You just want to bring everything around that data. And I just love the concept um, because it's so true in many cases. So, so in, this, in the central, you have all these, you think about this terra basic fusion data, you have all these services around, including Jupyter, you know, streaming, security, cloud application, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it's not just applications. It's, it's just a lot of, you know, how you retrieve the data, how you interact with the data. You want to interact the data and put the data back into the into the repository. You want to have your outputs taken out of it. So, so this is just give you a little bit of context. Um, next, please. And and this is what you know mostly is I specialize in, you know, scientific cloud computing. And the different scientists might not. In a, in a common solution. And, and I like to divide these, you know, <clears throat> in different kind of users. Uh, the first set is the super users, or I call super users or advanced users, where you have basically three types. You have this data in intensive uh, super user, which, which is, you know, basically AI. So this data in intensive, so it's very intensive on just feeding in data, uh, for example, running deep learning models requires a lot of input data um, just to start running. Even if you have, you know, infinite GPU memory, you still have, you know, a lot of data incoming and, you know, where this data is being stored is an issue. So then you have a second user where this data out intensive, so they don't require too many inputs, but they produce a lot of output uh, data, like simulations, right? So simulations, you just need some initial conditions, and then you can generate, you know, Thousands of thousands of thousands of terabyte of simulated data in astronomy, in earth science, in anywhere. Um, that also is, is a different kind of user. And then you have this the resource-intensive users, uh, which they not necessarily need a lot of input or output, but they, they do a lot of modeling and feeding. So thinking, for example, about you know exploring a parameter space and trying to feed or try to try different different combination of parameters. There's a lot of intensive jobs without too many, you know, too much input or without too much output. Uh, and then obviously any combination of those. But there's some other users as well that have, for example, no exposure or no experience whatsoever and they need some training. There is group or users that can provision hardware. So they say, well, I have a machine. I don't know what to do. Can I join your pool of resources and, you know, think about the open uh, science grid or, or Condor if you um, when you can bring uh, hardware uh, to, to, to increase, you know, your pool of resources. Uh, there's also, you know, users with, with cloud or, or with funds or credits that they have, um, they don't have hardware, but they have access to, to resources in some, some way. So they have a buy-in resources, right? And then you have these ephemeral users where um, doing workshops, right? So you want to you wanna teach about your data set, you want to teach about your, so you need to scale for, for a few days, for a week, your resources. So you allow everybody to interact, for example, through through notebooks, but then you can just shut, shut it down. So and I just want to put this, this, these two slides there because this is kind of what summarize uh, what is you know usually considered like a specific cloud computing. Um, next, please. So in particular, uh, we, we're talking about the Terra basic fusion. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide because it's don't already explain what, what, what it is, but on summarize, you know, it's talking about 2.5 uh, petabyte of data, HC5 files. Um, this is a big data problem if you want to 
thing. And we're trying to look for a solution to access and provide analysis to this data. And we're looking into building an AI infrastructure around this data. And then you can be obviously expanded to other data sets with similar characteristics. Next, please. So, so one of the problems that uh, we want to address with this building this AI infrastructure is, um, is taking advantage of, you know, these big data and cloud technologies. So, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, you know, uh, solutions like containers, Docker, Kubernetes, that allow you to run scale scalable applications on on the data and allows you to run anywhere. So you can run it on your your cluster, you can run it on cloud. Um, but at the same time, there's been an explosive, you know, advancing with deep learning in a much, much more refined models. And since NASA is moving also into the cloud, I think this all seems like a like a good solution to have everything in just one place, or at least conceptually, right? Um, in particular, this, the, the, the the science that is driving this 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 concept is, uh, for example, having this pixel level classification. Um, for, for clouds, right? One of the problems that people is having a lot, I mean, also in terms of the you know, um, climate um, science is, is identify clouds within images at a very accurate level. So you can have a very accurate estimate of, of the radiance of the cloud or the coverage. And <clears throat> cloud over, over, over sea is, is, is simple, but cloud over ice, over snow, uh, on the Arctic is, is very challenging. And this is where, you know, AI comes to come and, and help, especially not just running a toy model, but running at the scale, running for every every single um, image from, from Terra. So there's two problems here. One is defining a good model, and then how you want to run it uh, at a scale. Uh, next, please. Another another case is, is for example, not just identifying or classifying each pixel, but identifying an object as a whole like um, like Arctic cyclones, which again is very challenging to do over over uh, over ice or over snow. But if we have a way to identify this object, then we can have a you know good catalog, and, and then go through all the data sets and trying to extract all that information that is hidden all somehow in in in, in all the data. And this is just using all of the instruments, trying to maximize the information you feed it to your artificial intelligence models. Uh, including, you know, the data from not just MODIS, but Aster and, and MISER and having this parallax information as well. So in an ideal world, if you fit it everything, you should have a very robust and, and, and accurate model. Um, next, please. And another problem related to, to looking at these images is to, for example, identify uh, volcanic plumes in the data. It all goes back to the same. It's a little contrast. Con con contrast um, with the background when you have uh, snow or, or or ice, so identify smokes is also is also challenging. Um, so again, <clears throat> we're talking about mission scale data uh, applications. We're talking about multi-channel information, and in particular, if everything goes back to how you want to train your models and and how you want to annotate these models, which brings us to, to, to our, our one of the, the goals is to not just develop this infrastructure, but also develop an infrastructure for annotating these images at a scale, or at least to, to have enough to have a good, a good model. So <clears throat> next, please. So what are the goals of this AI infrastructure that we build around this? And, and Sharon mentioned that um, when we build this infrastructure, it's all about running in a way that is cloud friendly. So we can give that sort of a package. I give it to you know <clears throat> NASA to run on their own machines, give it to all science to run in their own place if they have a copy of the data or at least a sub copy of the data. Because it's very easy to run now nowadays using you know these cloud like technologies. Um, it makes it easy to migrate to different, you know, or even have a hybrid component. So the goal is to well, to develop a workflow and, and a sophisticated interface to annotate these complex images which is very challenging, but it's very needed for, for training models. And then after that is to build a scalable and robust infrastructure to, to train, but also to evaluate these models and also to share other models and be, you can come with your own model and apply it to the data at, at a scale, right? 
And for that, you need, you need to find some protocols and guidelines to to do so. So basically, um, you need to find a, a very a very well documented API. Think about you know programming you know, components, and then obviously try to provide a and harmonious and 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 integration with, with NASA with the NASA cloud uh, architecture. So try to see if, you know we all in the same page. We all use the same infrastructure. You all use the same language. So next one, please. And this is my last. Um, so this is what a modern scientific infrastructure will look like. Uh, and again, you've probably seen this in many many places in different contexts. So you have a uh, you have different different layers. At the bottom you have the storage layer, which could be, uh, it could be just as simple as a, as a POSIX file system or a shared file system, or it could be, you know, S3 uh, buckets or object, OSN. Anything where you have access directly to the data um, is your, your storage layer, and then you have your, your low-level applications or your metadata or middleware, where you have this super metadata server that has all the knowledge about the images, about the model, about uh, you know the annotation. So so you ask this metadata server where these images are. You ask this metadata server what images are annotated and what they are annotations. And then you can ask also um, what models has been run on this data or what models are available, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have this this extra layer. And then on the top you have the application where you have this this metadata query or user interface. Um, this annotation and labeling interface and the AI training and inference. So you annotate, you sort of first you query your data, you annotate and label them, you can train and then evaluate the models, um, and then you can obviously visualize that at the end. And everything is backed up by either uh, you know on premises, you know, hardware, like just normal hardware running running this, connected through obviously um, through all these, uh, through APIs and through containerized you know, solutions, but also back up by you know cloud computing resources where you can actually ship you know some jobs in and then get them back. So this is again this is a very standard picture, uh, but in this case we are applying this to the third data set. We are focusing also on the annotation part, which is a very heavy component. And as you see in the bottom, this is not an easy job. There's a lot of people involved in this because this requires a lot of you know interdisciplinary you know um, team to put to put something like this together um, at, at the scale of, of so. um okay. should we entertain questions at this point yes so uh with that i just want to finish and, and say thank you and if there's any questions just please uh, let them know Okay, so before we get into, we're going to draw, like, report our conclusions about this. Are there questions about the, the cloud compute applications, scientific computing in the cloud? All right, maybe when we pull it all together, some more things will come to mind. So thank you, Matthias. So I've got bring bring Don back, pull it all together. So this is, since I hear the Bethesda meeting is supposed to be about policy, I thought I would spend a little time to review this and, and put it in higher level context. Oops, I'll go forward, right? So remember the, the basic process that, the, that this grant went through and these people went through was to identify a driver. They wanted to shift from process oriented, not computing process oriented, but physical process oriented things like cyclones or volcanic eruptions, certain events, to climate-oriented questions, which requires access to a whole data set or large subsets of it. Right? The blocker that they incurred was they couldn't get the students to be productive enough because they were always assembling large custom data sets. Right? And the, the, so the, the, the need that they saw was a need for a fused data set to enable scientists to do these sorts of things a reusable fuse data set to cut down the labor and the data handling required to do the projects. Their solution, you could have solved the skin this cat many ways, their solution was to produce a 2.4 petabyte comprehensive data set covering the years 2000 to 2015. They wrote a grant and got it. And the, the result is that they now have a capability of addressing climate-oriented questions uh, large, 
and what we would call large mission scale questions, which we think of as kind of a niche in the whole earth science ecosystem, right? As, we, as you may have learned, uh, the solution we have with the 2.4 petabyte data set is not ideal because we only have about 350 petabytes of it accessible for science use right now. In fact, da because data is expensive. Right. The kind of issues that, we're, that we have identified by working with these people is that fused data is large compared to the input because it's kind of denormalized for access. It is not inexpensive. It is not expensive to recompute it. So if you think about the cloud, whatever your co cloud contract is, the cost of storing 2.4 petabytes per year, the cost to re refuse the data after this project was done, we did some studies, was only four thousand dollars on. Amazon on, um, oh, what is the bid price thing? You, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, the, the data set is meant to be reusable and not confined to the scope of Larry's students. The data are not transformed as far as information contact, they're fused. Um, and how to socialize this data set within the community is now an issue because things like public hosting and things like hosting on the Open Science Network um, depend on there being a community and some demand for this data, not just the demand of a parochial scientist at a university with his parochial students. Uh, an interesting question that we're on our way to learn is that this is level 1B data, it's calibrated radiances. And how large the user community is for this sort of thing is an interesting and open question. And, and estimates range from 10 to 1,000. I think we're about to learn it. And then how does this fit into national strategy, what funding agencies want to fund, right? We've heard a lot today about national strategy being to, to move lots of computing in the cloud. Uh, this, if this is specialized scientific computing, is that part of the same strategy or not? Or is it, is it ubiquitous? What does this really mean in the context of people who fund and want to do it? Or want to, want to, want to support this kind of work? So, you know, you, you need a picture. Everybody needs a picture. And if you think about that, this, this is how I think of it and how some people think of it. In particular, in the case where, where I live in an institution where we support principal investigators that are faculty and have graduate students. So at the top of the apex is guys doing science. They're, it's a small group and it's a semi-autonomous group because they're faculty in a department at a university. Uh, but they're trying to do something ambitious that was actually well motivated by trying to get more science out and in practice working with lots of students. Uh, but they needed a lot of software. And if you think about software, there's really the, kind of like two components to it that I'm trying to show here, right? There's the corpus of all possible software that you might be interested in. And then there's the software you select. And in addition, there's the expertise to use it well. So if you can go ask somebody about Dask, many people will love it. Some guy will shrug and say, not fast enough for me. And it, does that mean Dask is not fast enough? Or does that mean he didn't have the time to understand how to use it? Well? All right, so there's software and being able to use it properly and selecting the, the right kind of software components to do a kind of project. And similarly for provisioning in the hardware land and what, what, is it, what does Amazon call it? Undifferentiated heavy lifting land, right? There's a lot of components here and of course, part of the art is selecting appropriate ones and knowing how to use it. So you can think of this as kind of being a software stack that you have to have expertise and select and the ability selection. Everybody ends up with an architecture where they've consciously architected or not, right? Everybody ends up with a deployment architecture whether they architected it or not, right? And the question is how much work do you need here? How much do you work here? Given what your funding is up here, right? And then lastly, there's the whole science ecosystem what do agencies want? How do agencies want to push the ecosystem around? What do they see as a future? How do they see people doing that? And in the NASA world, we're seeing a lot of a lot of pressure and enthusiasm to learn the cloud, and to and to cause people to learn how to use cloud techniques rather than other techniques. So if you if you look at that as if you kind of look at that as a frame of reference to understand a project like this, and we leave the science behind, right? If you know, what, what could you make a comment about this project, right? Could it have used, for example, virtual data techniques if it was really well understood in the beginning that the cost of recomputing it, re recomputing a fusion product is not that, is not that expensive, right? And if, he, if they would have done, it, and if they would have realized that, 
is realizing a project to recompute data on the fly within the scope of what this group could do. All right, so is there a middleware framework for it? And could the middleware framework be effectively, effectively uh, applied instead of building a instead of building a deliverable as a data set, rather build the data set as a fusion service, right? Unknown to me, but a question that's on my mind, right? And similarly, there's questions like in a deployment argument, or, uh, de deployment environment. This thing was originally targeted for HPC systems with minimal supporting libraries. The original concept was all that you needed was an HDF5 library. We can now learn that we can extend that to some HDF5 supplied servers, right? And it was gonna be file-based, but it was also optimized for streaming, right? This data set currently exists as a set of sort of 32 gigabyte files. And even within the HDF5 thing, the, the images are rather large. If you want to browse them, you still do a substantial amount of IO, right? Could that have been done or done better if there was a better solution architect to it? Architecture available to the people, because remember fundamentally in our environment, you're talking to a small group on top. In the science echo, then there's the comments about the science ecosystem, which are strategic, I guess, which is how does one obtain resources? As I pointed out before, the resources to do this project, it basically came from three pockets, right? It came from the NASA grant for the acumen and the effort of the people. It came from NSF and Illinois to, to provide the resources to do the computation and the initial storage. And now resources are coming from Amazon in the form of a public data set. And the open storage network is another kind of public data set. And finally from NASA to archive everything that doesn't fit on those two, two sites. So these things are multi, th this project, even though it is done by a small science group, requires actually a very substantial and sophisticated assembly of resources from many, from many places, right? Uh, and then, you know, so that is, the tangible resources that you needed to do things. And then my prior comments kind of address what kind of ecosystem do people live in and, and what is the direction for that, for that ecosystem to make people that are going off to solve a practical problem have access to this kind of pyramid of acumen that is needed really to pull off bigger projects, right? How small of a group can you have to do something effective given you have to master these kinds of materials? So I think this is the, yeah, this is the summary slide, right? Is, is that what, you know, so what, what, well, we're sitting here in ESIP, except I'm standing, right? Um, I think what would be, what, what we see as useful in this context is recognition that people are doing large and mission scale data. They'll never be as numerous as people doing small studies. They'll never be as numerous as com com commercial exploitation because people are doing fundamental science Right, but we we need to find a way to take their their recognize their needs as valid, and find a way of shimming in their needs to these larger projects where they might be sort of outvoted, right? Not prominent enough, right? There's a uh, uh, you know there's for example there's large solution spaces for middleware and provisioning, and that implies complex architectural decisions, and the ability to, the ability for a small group to make reasonably good decisions is an interesting area that also ESIP can touch, right? And so the, the thing that strikes us, given our level of experience in ESIP, is that the ESIP clusters are a place to share expertise and to either present difficulties doing a large amount of work or, or being a place to go and advocate uh, uh, for enhancement or provide enhancement to additional solutions. And that's what we have to say. So I'm new to the data um, in the cloud. I've done other cloud work. But um, I was wondering about data licensing and ownership. You know, Ken Casey asked a question about that this morning. And are, are um, you know, templates of licenses being developed like they are for like on uh, GitHub? Uh, yeah, so licenses? we went through this in practice. So in practice, this data is derived from NASA open data and is in turn, to the extent we can make it open and available, it's open and available, resource limited in making it all open and available. So this particular data set, there's no, there's no issues of proprietariness. 
we uh, actually had going through the exercise with, with NASA about what kind of license to put on this data. And everybody's looking at their shoes and we said, create a common zero and I think that's what we told them. And that's what our library would recommend, the Illinois library would recommend. So it, so part of the experience for us has been releasing this in the public and we don't get to hide in a great extent under NASA skirts. So fundamentally this releases, NASA has been, I would say, assisting us, assisting us getting the, with working with AWS and getting the free hosting. We had, we did the work with the Open Science Network to get that hosted. And one of the things uh, that I think if you go visit the websites, we're still not where we want to be is number one is additional friendly release materials. Number two, so we're leaning very heavily on, you know, the, the materials at the DAC. Where, where are the paths? Right. And that's proper, but we have our own layer that we would like to document. And the most the most significant documentation we have is the algorithm theoretic document, right? We're not able to use the CMR, right? So getting metadata about what's in there. For Terra, there's a kind of shim because every 233rd orbit repeats the, is the same path. So it's not a general metadata problem. And for people in the know, there's at least shims. But the whole support, and now the kind of responsibility to understand how popular the data sets are, that they're worthy of these kind of contributed supports is something that we're just beginning to think about. So the data that you're, that you're putting out there, are you actually reprocessing it? No, it's being the... reformatted and fused. Okay. okay. So for example, some of the scaled integers are being expanded to floats. Okay, so, so you are doing some reformatting. If NASA had all that data already in the cloud, would that change your solution in terms of what you need to do? So I would say it sure would change the thinking, right? In fact, you know, if you could look at this all in hindsight, and this grant was not in the last access proposal, it was in the previous access proposal. So that was a different world. But you think that what we could have done is taken all those precursors, put them in the cloud, build a fusion engine on top of it, it, but, you know, you work at the pace you can evolve, not at the pace that in retrospect you could have done, right? Well, I guess that's where I was going is, is if, if they have plans to put all the data sources that you were using in the cloud, would that then change your solution to the point where you would take a step back and re reformulate what you're doing? Yeah, if we got a do-over, I would certainly take a step back and think about this because there's petabytes of storage at stake. Right. And, that's, and, that's what I was thinking. And no one really, the, the project did not really realize the ratio of compute time to actually fuse it because they were thinking about the, they were thinking about what, make the, what made the data easy to use as scientists. Right. The other thing I was going to say is you talked about being able to just recompute on the fly and that's great, especially if you have kind of a small user base where you're not doing that every time you turn around. I, I mean, I work on Landsat. I'd okay, yeah. be doing that every minute of the day, yeah. multiple times over, because you know it gets used too much. So there's no way data yeah. can fly for most of what so, I have would work. But for you, it might. So, so it's an interesting question. What is the user base? And what is the demand for accessing this data? And that is given with the subset that we have up on, on these two distribution mediums, understanding that and understanding if we get a metric about how many times it's taken, but we also don't understand how well of a job we're doing socializing the data in the community. All right, so we'll have an unknown. We'll only know how well we did given the good, did, how well we did the job of socialization. And so that's where we stand right now and that's kind of the next challenge. But it's easy to Thank compute. It takes $4,000 to compute the whole thing and you know the demand, now all of a sudden you have a grip on the right way to whether a static data set is best. Can I make a comment? Yes. So I just want to mention that the whole data set is on NASA's hands, if you want to say it like that. It's, it's, it, when we move the data into NASA, the, the, so now we are in the process uh, to figure it out what's going to be next uh, for that data set. So basically NASA now owns a copy of the whole data set. These subsamples are for the public to access the data and to see how valuable the data is. But the, there is a, an existing copy uh, on the NASA cloud archive right now, but we're still figuring out what's 
uh, what's going to happen to that data set. Yeah, how to bring the whole data. So, so this ambitious AI looking for volcano plumes everywhere, the, the sampler is not the right data set. Right? It's the whole data set is needed, but that's where we're at. So we said ongoing, and the theme is data at work. So we try to cover those bases. So one of the things I was wondering about is that, you know, as we're we're looking at kind of a, a post-mortem of this project and some of the, the issues that came up, um, I was just at the session before this, which was talking about a, a new role in our world, data stewardship, and people trying to create a, a role. And one of the things I wonder about is, does a role of like a science solutions architect exist in many places? That it's so often that, um, you know, there's some science problems that researchers on their own with Python can solve it. And then there's a whole class of problems that researchers don't know how deep they're into it until they're into it. And are there many places that have a, a role like within ESIP uh, of a solutions architect, like people that can come in and say, wait, stop, this is not a, a good idea, or here's a better idea, or let me check with my ESIP peers and see what technologies people are using that might help with that. Is this something that we've kind of identified as a, a thing? Does this happen in different uh, organizations? Question mark? Um, I think, uh, I haven't thought about it using that exact term, but I think it's an interesting term. I think it helps sort of, it, it conjures a certain picture, which I think is useful. Um, and I, but to maybe put it a slightly different way, it seems like what, what Larry was trying to do here with this was to create, and this is what we struggle with, and I think maybe what you're getting at with the idea of a science solutions architect is to identify kind of a lowest common denominator that people can build on from a, you know, and, and on the, so I'm at the Atmospheric Science Data Center, um, you know, DAC, and, and that's one of the things we sort of struggle with, like how far, for, as the data set managers of the data system, how far down the path of what you're talking about, solutions are, like, do we go? Like, to, like what level do we provide to the users and stop? Because we can anticipate certain things that people want to do, but we don't know, we can't know everything, nor should we know where's that line? And I think doing this with L1B data, I think, Larry, the idea was, I'm going to fuse all the terror data into L1B, and then people can build you know, on that. Is that sort of what you mean with sort of a solution, science solutions architect? That, like, or or in who, whose responsibility is that? Is it the data right. system, or is it the science user? So. And, and I get the sense that a lot of science users come to the DACs for help. Like, I'm trying to do this with the data. I don't quite understand how to do it. Right. And they're hoping that you can say, oh, wait, here's here's how to do this with the data and the infrastructure that we have, but that you may not be staffed to do that for everybody. Uh, yeah, probably probably not. We can give them some guidance and, you know, like you, people have talked about, you know, we can sample solutions, Python notebooks, and a certain amount mm -hmm. of services, you know, you know, that that people can build their own solutions on top of the data, but but we can't create an end user turnkey tool for every possible use case, you know? So I think right. it's, that's the thing we, mm -hmm. that's the thing we struggle with. I mean, it's a legitimate question. I think you guys raised some excellent questions here in your last several slides about some, some challenges around this. Mm -hmm. Any other organizations here that feel like they're, they kind of live in that space? Preferably one that's as far away from Ben as, as possible, just to, <laughs> Yeah, actually, in at uh, NCAR, where I've uh, worked as uh, observational data uh, manager, um, the same sort of issue applied. Where and, and this lowest common denominator, finding those common services, you know, the most common services, supporting those well, and then the rest becomes analysis, which sometimes means a proposal uh, with with a solutions architect or at least a portion of one built in, that kind of thing. But um, but it is a difficult because. As you know, the, the research you know world. I mean, that's why they're, they're they're individual research departments because they do things one way and another group does it another way, and they build the entire workflows around their their um, solutions, the way that they manage the data. So I think that key is finding that finding that common denominator that that's 
as much as you can in common with all the team and then, mm. then doing proposals and other things beyond. So I'm at USGS Eros, and so one of the things that we do with um, science work that looks as though it's going to become an operational thing is um, we actually have a whole process by which we go through um, what we call research to operations um, in, in terms of a flow that we go through. Um, and we kind of do that at a point where it looks like something might become operational, and then how do you bring that into our enterprise system? So so it is something that I think we we think of not for every project, but but for the ones that are looking like they're going to become an operational type data project. Yeah, I work at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado, and um, we have a lot of you know medium-sized science projects. Some of them involve uh, NASA space missions um, that have that are reasonably well-funded, and then others that are really small and not so well-funded. So the the ones that are more fun, better funded, um, there's a data systems group at LASP, and I work in the data systems group. And so we will team with the scientists to help develop the software solutions. We come with more of a software engineering mentality well, they kind of bring the science and kind of meet in the middle. Um, but it's always a battle for a lot of these other smaller projects. The scientists sometimes have a hard time seeing the value in software engineering and say, well, my grad student can write that code. Mm -hmm. And so we get a lot of little one-off siloed things. So that's been you know, a certain number of us at last um, within the data systems group are really trying to push this idea of some reusable software infrastructure. And so the idea of software as infrastructure that we can build on. And so the, the web team at LASP has, has made a lot of progress in that regard. How broadly reusable do you think some of your solutions are outside of your organization? Um, so the one that I work most closely with is called Lattice. It's a the elevator pitch, it's a, it's a, it enables data interoperability through a unified data model. And this is more of a structural data model, um, not so much metadata. Um, so, you know, we, we have adapters to various data formats. We can perform operations on data and then output the data in other formats. So it's a very general, it's a, the sort of thing that, you know, probably a dozen people here have, have done themselves. Mm -hmm but usually in a kind of a limited um, target, targeted um, domain. So we, we try to be very agnostic, um, very mathematically oriented. And so that technology, um, we, we are just completing a uh, NASA AIST um, funded work called High Lattice, which builds on the Lattice software to do hyperspectral imagery analysis in the cloud. So I'm really interested to hear your conclusion that um, generating the data wasn't really the costly bit. It's right. the managing, you know, dealing with the gravity of all the data that's, mm -hmm. that's it's the big problem. So that's been our approach is we um, have, we, we, we try to leave the data in its native form for whatever reason. And then, you know, with the Lattice software, we're able to do that dynamic adaptation to the data to be able to subset just the bits the users need be able to bring it into a distributed compute environment um, where operations can be performed. Of course, this, this requires scientists to think differently about how they deal with data. Right. Mm -hmm. But this is a perfect example. You know, we're using functional programming where we can define algorithms as pure functions. We can move those functions to where the data lives. And so I think this is a, a great new paradigm. Um, scientists just aren't all there yet. Or, or need additional hand-holding in order to kind of get there. So it, it, it does seem like an interesting opportunity with, you know, ESIP is an organization of so many people that are in roles that are similar to yours, that are solving problems that are similar to what you're solving and, you know, how we can 
find each other and support each other in these things and see if we can find some more, more reuse. Anybody else out there in TV land? All right. Thank you so much. This has been a great opportunity to bring all this together and we love being able to share this experience and hear some of your experiences out there. So thank you and thank you, Matthias. Thank you.